Assalamu alaikum everybody. Today we will be looking at Salmonella. That's a group of bacteria, not a single bacterium. But before getting into the video, I'd like to tell you guys that these videos are meant for educational purposes. Things and treatments may change with time. If I get wrong or miss anything, your input is always welcomed in the comments section. Grab a pen and a notepad and let's get started. Salmonella are gram-negative rods. They are facultative intracellular bacteria. They do not ferment lactose, but do produce H2S. These features are used in their lab identification. Salmonella are oxidase negative. They are acid labile, and salmonella belong to the family Enterobacteriaceae. As I've told you that salmonella is a group of bacteria, that's not a single bacterium, it contains different species. I'll talk about them later in today's video. Salmonella cause salmonellosis. To be specific, salmonella causes enterocolitis, enteric fevers like typhoid fever or paratyphoid fever, septicemia and metastatic infections. As in this picture, you can see the salmonella. Lecture outline. We are done with the introduction. Now we'll be looking at the classification of bacteria and also salmonella. Then we'll look at the nomenclature of salmonella. Then its morphology, habitat in transmission, pathogenesis, clinical findings, lab diagnosis, treatment, prevention, and at the end, as usual, we'll review the lecture. Let's start with the bacterial classification. Bacteria are further classified into spirochetes. They're also classified on the basis of acid-fast staining into acid-fast bacteria. And there's an exception, that's the mycoplasma bacteria. Bacteria are also classified based on gram staining into gram positive. We are done with all of them. If you guys are interested, be sure to check out the channel. And also into gram negative. Gram negative are further subdivided into cocci like Neisseria, Neisseria gonorrhoeae and Neisseria meningitis. And also into rods. Rods are further subdivided into aerobic like Pseudomonas, facultative and anaerobic like Bacteroides. Facultative are further subdivided into curved like Campylobacter, Helicobacter and Vibrio. We're done with them. If you guys are interested, be sure to check out the channel or I'll link these videos in the description or in the top right corner. And also into straight ones and straight are further subdivided into enteric and related that include E. coli, Enterobacter, Serratia, Klebsiella, Salmonella, Shigella, and Proteus. Also into zoonotic, that includes Brucella, Francisella, Pasteurella, and Yersinia. And into respiratory, that includes Haemophilus, Bordetella, and Legionella. But that's not all about the gram-negative bacteria classification. They're also classified based on different shapes, like into Diplococci, Cocobacilli rods, and comma-shaped. Diplococci are further classified based on maltose fermentation. If a bacterium ferments maltose, it's Neisseria meningitidis, and if it doesn't, it's Neisseria gonorrhoeae. Cocobacilli include Haemophilus influenza, Brucella, Pasteurella, and Bordetella pertussis. I've recently uploaded a video on Bordetella pertussis. If you've missed that, be sure to check it out. Rods are further subdivided based on lactose fermentation. If bacteria ferment lactose, they are going to be faster or slow fermenters. Fast ones include Klebsiella, E. coli, and Enterobacter. And slow ones include Serratia and others. And non-lactose fermenting bacteria are further subdivided based on oxidase test. If a bacterium is oxidase positive, it's Pseudomonas. And if bacteria are oxidase negative, they are going to be Shigella, Salmonella, Proteus, and Yersinia. Comma-shaped bacteria are further subdivided based on certain criteria, like if a bacterium produces urease, it's H. pylori. If it grows in 42 degrees Celsius temperature, it's Campylobacter jejuni, And if it grows in alkaline media, it's Vibrio cholerae. Now let's look at the classification of Salmonella. Salmonella species are further classified into typhoidal and non-typhoidal species. Typhoidal species are those that are responsible for causing typhoid fever, and non-typhoidal species are those that cause diarrhea, in enterocolitis, and metastatic infections such as osteomyelitis. The typhoidal species are Salmonella typhi and Salmonella paratyphi, while the non-typhoidal species are many serotypes of Salmonella enterica, which includes Salmonella cholerasius nomenclature or the naming system of salmonella. There are three methods of naming these salmonella, Ewing, Kaufman and White, DNA hybridization analysis. Ewing divides the genus salmonella into three species, 
namely Salmonella typhi, Salmonella cholerasis, and Salmonella enteritidis. There, in this scheme, there's only one serotype in each of the first two species and 1500 serotypes in the third one. Kaufman and White assign different species names to each serotype. There are roughly 1500 different species, and species are usually named for the city in which they were isolated. The third approach to naming the Salmonella is based on relatedness determined by DNA hybridization analysis. Morphology Salmonella, a rod shaped bacteria, as you can see in this picture, this is the Bacillus bacteria. It varies in size from 2 to 5 micrometers long and 0.8 to 1.5 micrometers wide. Salmonella are pink colored or they might be red. The reason is they're gram negative. I do have a video on gram staining. I've linked it above. Be sure to check it out. Structure. Salmonella are encapsulated bacteria. They're not responsible for forming spores. Salmonella are mortal because they've got flagella. Salmonella have antigens. Their antigens are O cell wall antigen, flagellar H antigen, and capsular VI, virulence antigen. The O antigens, which are the outer polysaccharides of the cell wall, are used to subdivide the salmonella in groups A1. There are two forms of H antigens, phases 1 and 2. Only one of the two H proteins is synthesized at any one time, depending on which gene sequence is in correct alignment for transcription into mRNA, the messenger RNA. The VI, virulence antigen, the capsular polysaccharide, are antiphagocytic and are an important virulence factor for Salmonella typhi, the agent of typhoid fever. This is how Salmonella looks like under the microscope. This is pink or red colored. The reason is it's gram negative. It is rod shaped and this is its flagella which makes this bacteria motile. Habitat. Hosts. Humans are the hosts. Persons who temporarily excrete the organism, the salmonella, during or shortly after an attack of enterocolitis or coronic carriers who excrete the salmonella for years. The most frequent animal sources is poultry. Here you can see the chicken and also eggs. Here you can see this cute egg. But meat products that are inadequately cooked have been implicated as well. Dogs and other pets, including turtles, snakes, lizards, and iguanas are also the sources of salmonella. Transmission. Salmonella is transmitted by the ingestion of food or water contaminated with human, infected with any of the diseases caused by salmonella or animal feces. Eating raw or undercooked poultry or eggs, drinking unpasteurized milk, touching infected animals, their feces, or the environment in which they live. Typhoidal salmonella serotype can only be transferred between humans and can cause foodborne illness as well as typhoid and paratyphoid fever. Non-typhoidal salmonella serotypes are zoonotic and can be transferred from animals and between humans. Pathogenesis. There are three types of salmonella infections like the enterocolitis, typhoid and other enteric fevers, and septicemia. But prior to talking about these infections, let us have a deeper look at certain antigens. The VI capsular antigen prevents the phagocytosis. The flagella promotes the motility and also promotes the type 3 secretion system to attach and insert into non-phagocytic cells. The third antigen, endotoxin, it targets the neurovascular system and decreases circulating neutrophils. Why? Because neutrophils are going to do phagocytosis and bacteria do not want that. Bacteria want to invade the tissues. That's why bacteria release endotoxins and endotoxins decrease circulating neutrophils. Let's start with enterocolitis. Enterocolitis is characterized by an invasion of epithelial and subepithelial tissue of small and large intestines. Strains of salmonella that do not invade do not cause disease. The organisms penetrate both through and between the mucosal cells into the lamina propria with resulting inflammation and diarrhea. Neutrophils limit the infection to the gut and the ages and mesenteric lymph nodes. Bacteremia is infrequent in enterocolitis. The infection dose of salmonella is higher as compared to Shigella. It involves 100,000 salmonella. Gastric acid is an important host defense. Gastrectomy or use of antacids lowers the infectious dose significantly. Now let's talk about typhoid and other enteric fevers. 
In typhoid and other enteric fevers, infection begins in the small intestine, but few gastrointestinal symptoms occur. Salmonella enter and multiply in mononuclear phagocytes of the pears patches. These patches are present in small intestine. And then the salmonella spread to phagocytes of the liver, gallbladder, and spleen. This leads to bacteremia, and bacteremia is associated with the onset of fever and other symptoms, probably caused by endotoxin. Survival and growth of the organism within phagosomes in phagocytic cells are a striking feature of this disease, as is the predilection for invasion of gallbladder, which can result in establishment of the carrier state and excretion of bacteria in the feces for long periods. The third disease in the list is septicemia. It accounts for only about 5-10% to of salmonella infections and occur in one of the two settings. A patient with an underlying chronic disease such as sickle cell anemia or cancer or a child with enterocolitis. Bacteremia results in seeding of many organs with osteomyelitis, pneumonia and meningitis as the most common sequelae. Osteomyelitis in a child with sickle cell anemia is an important example of this type of salmonella infection. Previously damaged tissues such as infarcts and aneurysm, especially aortic aneurysms, are most frequent sites of metastatic abscesses. Salmonella are also an important cause of vascular graft infections. Clinical findings After an incubation period of 12 to 48 hours, enterocolitis begins with nausea, vomiting, and then progresses to abdominal pain and diarrhea, which can vary from mild to severe, with or without blood. Usually, the disease lasts a few days and is self-limiting and causes non-bloody diarrhea and does not require medical care except in very young or very old people. Symptoms vary according to the type of disease caused by salmonella. If it's typhoid fever, then it will have a slow onset. And symptoms are fever and constipation rather than vomiting and diarrhea. And diarrhea may occur early but usually dissipates by the time the fever and bacteremia occur. After the first week, as the bacteremia becomes sustained, high fever, delirium, tender abdomen, and enlarged spleen occur. The raw spots, i.e. rose-colored macules on the abdomen, are associated with typhoid fever but occur only rarely. Salmonella also causes septicemia, so its symptoms begin with fever with little or no enterocolitis, and then proceed to focal symptoms associated with the affected organ, frequently bones, lungs, or meninges. Complications There are various complications associated with the infections or diseases caused by salmonella. Complications are intestinal hemorrhage, perforations, septicemia, and bacteremia. Lab Diagnosis We'll need samples of stool, blood, and bone marrow. In enterocolitis, the organism is most easily isolated from a stool sample. However, in enteric fevers, blood is used for isolating the organism, the salmonella. And the organism, the salmonella, is also isolated from bone marrow. Microscopy. On gram staining, salmonella appears to be gram negative because it does not retain the DNA and it then gets the pink color. It is bacillus-shaped bacteria. It varies in size from 2 to 5 micrometers long and 0.8 to 1.5 micrometer wide. It's pink or red colored. The reason is it's gram negative. This is how salmonella looks like under the microscope. It is rod shaped bacterium as you can see there. It is red colored and these are its flagella which makes salmonella motile. Culture. For colonies formation on culture plates, we'll use stool, blood and bone marrow samples. Blood culture is the procedure most likely to reveal the organism during the first two weeks of illness. Bone marrow cultures are often positive. Stool cultures may be positive, especially in chronic carriers in whom the organism is secreted in bile into the intestinal tract. Salmonella form non-lactose fermenting colorless colonies on meconikes or EMB agar. On TSI agar and alkaline slant and an acid butt, frequently with both gas and H2S black color in butt, are produced. Salmonella typhi is the major exception. It does not form gas and produces only a small amount of H2S. We'll go for blood tests in a person who is suffering from typhoid and we'll see leukopenia and anemia in that person. We'll also go for LFTs, liver function tests, and they're often abnormal, indicating hepatic involvement.
The salmonella isolate can be identified and grouped by the slide agglutination test into serogroup A, B, C, D, or E based on its O antigen. The diagnosis can be made serologically by detecting a rise in the antibody titer. Titer is antibody concentration, right? In the patient's serum, and we'll do that with the help of Vidal test. Treatment. Enterocolitis caused by salmonella is usually self-limiting disease, and that results without treatment but fluid and electrolyte replacement may be required. The treatment of choice for enteric fevers such as typhoid fever and septicemia with metastatic infection is either ceftriazone or ciprofloxacin. Ampicillin or ciprofloxacin should be used in patients who are coronic carriers of salmonella typhi. Cholecystectomy may be necessary to abolish the coronic carrier state. Focal abscesses should be drained surgically when it's feasible. Prevention by properly treating the sewage, by using the chlorinated water, by maintaining the personal hygiene like taking care of hand washing, by using the pasteurized milk, like pasteurization of milk is promoted, by eating properly cooked poultry, eggs, and meat. And there's also certain vaccines available for salmonella. The two vaccines. One contains VI capsular polysaccharide of salmonella typhi that's given intramuscularly and the other contains a live attenuated strain TY21A of Salmonella typhi and that's given orally. These two vaccines are equally effective. A new conjugate vaccine against typhoid fever containing the capsular polysaccharide V antigen coupled to a carrier protein, the third one, that is safe and immunogenic in young children. Vaccines are recommended for those who travel or reside in high-risk areas and also for those whose occupation brings them in contact with salmonella. All right, everybody, so let's have a quick recap. The organism we discussed today is salmonella. It is responsible for causing enterocolitis, other enteric fevers like typhoid fever and septicemia. It is transmitted by the ingestion of food or water contaminated with infected feces, like feces might have salmonella in it. Hosts are humans, poultry, eggs, and others. Diagnosis is based on gram staining, microscopy, culture, adult test, serology, LFTs, and also blood tests, if you remember. And for treatment, we'll go for fluid and electrolyte replacement therapy. Then there will be antibiotic treatment like ceftriazone, ciprofloxacin, and ampicillin. Cholecystectomy is necessary to abolish the chronic state. And if there are abscesses present, then surgical drainage is necessary. And that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you've got any suggestions, feel free to leave them below in the comments. And also, if you want to connect with me on my socials, I've got my Instagram and Twitter, both with the handle Medzokhra. And I'll see you in the next video. Till then, assalamu alaikum.